turn off the lights up and I'll switch it out. Can you get the lights up then? Okay, this drawing needs to be a bit out of focus. It looks better that way. <laughs> but the focus, is the focus operating from here? Or? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, if it's out of focus, that's good. I can't see. Um, I think there are really three stages of the work I've been doing, which could be interpreted by some as a gradual decline. And that's what one person told me, and I rather like the idea of that. Having recently read that book by J.K. Huisman's called Against the Grain, which sort of makes a great beauty out of decline and rotting away and decrepitude and so on. This was a third year project at the Polytechnic for a crematorium. And uh, slide overtones of Corbusier, of course. And it was a nice trick to, in this time, rush into the library and find the latest work of Corbusier and get to it before the teachers could, and then immediately translate it into one's current project. And if you look on the right hand of the building, there are windows which are lifted straight from the Villa Schotthaus in Ahmedabad. And they form the lighting for the offices that serve the crematorium. And I put this up really because I still sort of like it, even though it's a, an amazing crew from Corbusier. Uh, basically, it's a square on plan with a grid of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 36 columns. The chapels are in white, and you drive through there and unload the casket and take it right into the middle of the building and then into the two chapels. And I had great fun doing the presentation of this, of doing the elevation twice. And it was all done with black and white poster colour drawn in lines with a ruling pen and then smudged over to give a sort of Lake Corbu concrete effect. And then it was photographed with a blue filter. So it's, you know, sort of pretty straight architecture, actually. First one. No problems there. And then... Is that the wrong way? This building here which sort of fits in with the bowerless movement of the poly. And I'm very sorry that the other bowerless, John Davidson, I don't know what happened to him, and if anyone knows of him, would they shout out? Because he did a beautiful building on the same project, which looked like concrete cylinders supported on columns, and with funny-shaped windows cut into it. And he was really good, and he went to work for Russell Diplock. Uh, <laughs> giggles from the front there. Uh, and I wish someone would let me know what happened to him. He was a devout Catholic and quite a few projects by devout Catholics later on. I don't know what that has to do with this, but Arthur Drexler, when he was writing about Walter Piefler at the modern, intended that devout Catholicism should somehow affect one's work, which perhaps we could talk about later. Now, this was the furniture building. Uh, I think I've got another one. Can you see all right over there? Can't the projector be pushed a bit man? Oh. Well, let me know when it's in focus, because I can't see from here. Yeah, yeah. No. Yes. Perfect. One more? Good enough. OK. <laughs> so it's still fairly recognisable as a building. And this one, too, which is still a building. <laughs> <laughs> Right, 
to the bridge. Show me to the front. All right. You're going to ask a question? Yeah, just, just a very simple... Okay. <coughs> oh, Christ. <laughs> 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 I'd better stand still or you'll all get very tired. What, what was the question? Oh, well, I'll tell it when we stop. It's obvious, isn't it? It's just a question. Is that all right for them as is on the, uh, on my left? You can see now, all right? You couldn't before, could you? No. <laughs> Except there's a bit sort of flipping over. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Is it? Mike? Yes? Is it going to stay there? <laughs> is it going to stay there? <laughs> oh. um, first of all, could you go back to the others, please? There's the plan. Well, no, I, it's me that goes back to the plan. Oh, you go. Yeah. No, oh, no. the wrong way. <laughs> now, are those the right way around? Because they're not, yes. they, were, they were printed the other way. That's right. Yes. Well, that was a mistake. Yeah. That sort of uh, ceiling, I take it, it is. Coffered, you know, a vaulted ceiling. No, well, yes, that's is right. It? Yeah. That's I the floor could, structure. I could never as well. quite sort of tie it in to that end elevation that we've seen on the next slide. No. Could you explain that? Well, I, uh, it's so long ago, I have to look at the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a very different sort of thing to me. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, they represent two stages, you see, because... Because one is sort of flat iron triangular. Yes. And this is just a blob. I know. Well, you see, it brings out the point that often when you first do a drawing of a building and then try and develop it, the great danger is, isn't it, that you lose a lot of what you had in the initial. And we did this as a one semester long project as a design stage and then did working drawings of it in the following semester. And everyone got happy, like Mr. Foster of the Polytechnic, and sort of made me think about the construction of it in detail. And so uh, you're quite right because those floor panels, panels would suggest some sort of very rectilinear structure around the base of the well, floor, beam. Well, floor, not ceiling. Well, well floor right. and ceiling, you see, because you have the sort of roof structure. Yeah. You'll stand between the beams. Mm. And that formed the floor and the ceiling. And, and, and wasn't there an elevation where I might have missed it? Yeah, but I didn't put that in because I thought we'd all seen this enough, you see. Oh, and I'm just okay. really putting this up as an example yeah. to show this particular stage yeah. of the work I was doing. But that particular sort of outbuilding has always intrigued me. Oh, the one in front, the bubble in front? Yes. 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 That's all I have to say. Moving along then. Which is forward now? It's that one, isn't it? I've... <coughs> Let's see what happens if I press that one. <laughs> <laughs> was, that, was it the wrong one? Yeah, yeah. All right, left forward. Left foot forward. <coughs> this is the sin set. And I always love this building very much. And so that's why about four years ago I did some more drawings of it with a slightly different plan. For those of you that don't know about this, it was an entertainment centre and had a street leading up through the middle of it. And so you had parking off to either side, a drive-in movie screen, and various other types of things going on like bowling alleys and restaurants and things, and then an office block on top. And, uh, this shows the original plan here. The structure is really based around the circular ramp structure and the rectilinear pedestrian access system in front. And so the whole thing, the uh, entertainment decks either take the form of the circular ramp system or the rectilinear pedestrian system, depending on where they happen to be touching. 
and this is what it ended up like this time. And this is intentionally upside down because I get so sick of looking at that the right way up that I thought it might make a change for me uh, to see it another way up. You know, it's like when you work on a drawing for a long time, you get so sick of looking at it, you can't see it anymore as other people are going to see it. So it's nice to hold it in the mirror sometimes and at least get some sort of different view. And so I really eliminated the pedestrian escalator system and made it almost completely into a system with uh, escalators and things cutting it at right angles flowing on the drive-in screen. And that shows it, uh, a section of it at night time, <coughs> with all the cars shining their headlights onto the drive-in screen. And uh, the idea was behind this set of drawings was to do one huge master drawing, which would show every level of the plan in it. Because I thought it might be rather fascinating before I started <coughs> to have a drawing which was an incredible maze of lines you know, an unintelligible maze of lines, and then to get photo stats of it and just draw over that in coloured film what I wanted to show on each plan. So this is a drawing that just refers to the street systems and to the uh, drive-in movie screen. It was always a sort of very American type of building, I think. And done for that reason that I wouldn't intend that it be put in Leicester Square, but uh, it really, you know, it left Leicester Square about ten years ago and became more and more Americanized. I think all of us, when we first went to America, were fantastically moved by <coughs> violence and so on. So, that, you know, this really represents another stage of the work. So that's another print of the same drawing, which shows the air volumes. Because you've got cars running through a building, you know, it's obviously very important to separate one volume from another. And around the edge, you get the dots, which represent air curtains. And things like that. I think probably we all pass through this stage of uh, leaving the process of designing real buildings, actual buildings, buildings that differ only in terms of the shape of the buildings. You know, there was a stage when we were really substituting rounded corners for sharp edges. Uh, this was, I think, when we really started to redefine what was meant by a building. Again, this is something that's very much affected by going to America. And it's really a drive-in house, such as is represented on the yellow drawing over there, where you have a base number of service units, which might comprise kitchen and bathrooms and things. And then the living space can all be driven off and driven back again. So the house uh, the volume of the house depends on the number of people in it and whether it's summer or winter. So this sequence really represents uh, the house during the night time in the bottom drawing, you know, when everyone is there. Or maybe there's a party going on, so there are lots of additional mobile units. And then the middle one represents when they're all starting to leave. And the top one is vacation time in the summer when you've just got it's left. And there are lots of variations one can make on this when i um, taking a bit of the service unit with you, but these were all fairly familiar discussions at this particular time, <coughs> which I presume you know about. So I think already uh, the definition of the building is starting to change quite considerably. And this old plan too, the Cushing project. I'll only explain these if you ask me to, but I see most of you know about these projects.
which really ends with this, where I think what this project is really about is the compression of a building down from three dimensions into one dimensional plane on the ground. And that's a building measured in terms of the servicing it offers, of keeping the rain off and making it nice and warm inside when it's cold outside. I've left out for a moment the evocative side of a building. It's really talking about building as servicing. And that building is really compressed completely flat so that you have a layer of tubes set on a grid at ground level which provide all the services that the building used to offer. The flooring is made up of um, Xerox copies of one small original drawing and they're all directed at different angles, these tubes. And perhaps this following one will explain that. This was a model which was photographed in about 25 different positions of one air blowing tube. And transparencies were made of each photograph and then mounted onto a piece of glass. And then, like, a photograph of a foot was laid on. And I think this makes fun of the way of cutting through a building that one does when one draws a plan. You have the convention that you cut through the walls about three foot above floor level. And so in the same way, I've cut through this plan with consequent disastrous results on the person's ankle. And that's a very detailed drawing, I think, with a section through someone's leg with the uh, Achilles tendon and the tibia and fibula and the arteries and the veins showing and so on. So I think this gives you an idea of the scale at which this drawing happens. And the notion was that these tubes which blow air or Dr. Scholl's foot powder or supply coke or whatever, have some sort of symbiotic relationship with the grapes and peaches that are growing also there. But the one feeds the other. I intended that each tube should have a basic metal framework and electronic controls, but also have uh, a semi-organic bladder, which is feeding the peaches and the grapes and so on, and also supplying the air. And these are coloured workings out of the tubes. Um, the tubes that blow just air are blue, and there's a privacy belt around each person who rides on this thing, which is coloured red. And of course, as the person moves over this, directed by the tubes, uh, the tubes say in the bottom left <coughs> corner, stop blowing out red and blow out blue instead as the person comes over their little zone. So you would have a constantly changing area of red. The tube stops blowing red and starts to blow out blue. <coughs> Another working out. <coughs> and then this was another project in which this architecture was further reduced down. I happened to see in an article by David Green this photograph, and I thought it would do very well because I'd had a fungoid attack about three months before that and had to take a lot of special medicine to get rid of it. And while I was having that, I thought it might be rather nice to evolve some benevolent fungus who would keep one warm and happy, you know, which might dissolve whenever needed. 
and I imagine that this might be some testing of the fundus. You see. Uh, that they were using these soldiers as guinea pigs to try it out. And then there's another picture like this. Okay. Um, that's superseded up there because I presented it as a report that the army might have done, you see, assuming that a certain amount of grant money from the government was given and that they were able to use that money to experiment with these soldiers and then Princess Anne comes down to inspect the results. I never visualised it in this pattern, but I thought, and I forgot to bring this slide, but I did one more which showed a dead body with a fungus which at the point of death starts to push out flowers, you see, and consumes the loved one in that way. Uh, and I, I heard that a chemist up at MIT was working on this self-same idea about six months later. But I'm showing it tonight to illustrate how the architecture, the servicing of the architecture has become even more compressed as an idea, as a notion. What I want to do is draw for a moment now, so could we have the lights on, please? Because I want to talk a bit about the people who have influenced me. <laughs> and surprisingly, one of the people who influenced me most was a student at Rhode Island called Alan Wexler, who now lives in New York. He always had great problems getting through the course because his attitude to the design problems he was given was rather bizarre. And he did a great project for the uh, Rhode Island School of Design Mechanical Museum. And it really had a big impact on me. He did it before I arrived there, but he told me about it. And it was really fantastic. And uh, see, the problem was given as a very straightforward building project. And there was a museum at the Rhode Island School of Design. And the faculty suggested that there might be an extension added onto it, which would um, take the form of a mechanical museum. And what he did was to make a presentation at the end of the semester uh, just with Xeroxes. Everyone else came in with huge presentation drawings, you see, of their building designs. And he didn't show up all semester, just walked in in the last day with these four or five sheets of Xeroxes. And what it looked like, this was the plan of the museum the existing museum. They had a room there, and then another room there. Maybe another one up there. <coughs> and on this first Xerox, he plotted all the plans of the paintings on the wall, looking down at the frames. Maybe they had another room off there with perhaps two paintings. <coughs> the next Xerox would have, say, this painting disappeared and put in there. And then maybe the third Xerox would have this painting scrubbed out and put over there. And then this one over there. So on the, when it came to the last one, you had this same plan shape. But this was jam-packed with paint. And you, know, you can see what's happening now. This became the RISD Mechanical Museum. While this was all that was left of the existing museum. And I thought that was really interesting, that. You know, he didn't really design a single thing for it. And, you know, it was really twisting the whole notion of architecture. It was to 
great upset. They couldn't fail him. It was too nice a project, too nice an idea. And I'm talking about these now because I think in the work I show next, perhaps you'll see how that influenced what I was doing. Um, I think also David Green's moratorium on all new architecture had a big impact. The fact that after that, although I tried to design buildings, nothing seemed to happen. And I didn't get any ideas or anything. So the work after that represented much more the poking of fun at architecture, I think, of not taking it too seriously, and perhaps an involvement in the process of designing rather than the actual designing. So can we have the lights out? It's over there, isn't it? This was another image that really interested me. It's the town of Hamburg. And this inland sea that was called the Binnen Alster. If you can't read it up there, I'll just say what it's about. Uh, there's the railroad station, which is around about the middle of the picture. And a causeway leading out of it with railroad tracks built on it. And the Germans during the war realized that the English bombers, the RAF, would try and bomb the railroad station. And they realized what a sitting duck it was because of its location. It was easy to spot from the air. So in the next slide, it shows what they did. You had the railway station, but they put plywood planks over the Binnen Alster and moved it up and then built a dummy causeway across the top and painted black lines on the plywood strips to make them look like streets. And I always think, you know, how amazed the citizens of Hamburg must have been at what was going on. They must have wondered what was going on. You know, to see these plywood sheets laid down and black lines drawn on them. And how worried they would have been had they realized what was going on. But somehow, I sort of tie this up with the work of Super Studio. It seems very similar in a way, that you don't have, the implications of this is that you don't have climaxes anymore, that everything is one level. There aren't any high points or low points. This could represent a Super Studio grid. There are no points to focus upon. So I started uh, doing drawings of a very different type. <coughs> Not being able to design buildings anymore, I tried to twist the notion of what I understood as being a building. And this was called the inside-outside room. So you can see that everything sticks down beneath the surface of the floor. So when you have a chair, all you're left with is little uh, holes in the floor that represents the legs turned inside out. And the lights are shining up out of the ceiling. And you get all the pipework exposed into the room. And like the underwear, which has been casually left on the floor, is molded into the floor rather than sticking up out of it. These are one of the two drawings that were at the Museum of Bonn Art. And this represents a motel room done as a sort of joke working drawing. And uh, it's very carefully drawn, not in terms of the building that's being planned, but representing a building that's been up about 10 years. So none of the walls are at right angles to each other. And I don't know if you can see from where you're sitting, but say the baseboard heating panels are all slightly out of line. Nothing lines up 
just like a building when it's really built. And the doors don't fit properly. It's really a cheap American hotel, this, you see. And the idea behind was it that it should record some very beautiful event that might have happened in the hotel. So every part of the room interior becomes precious, <laughs> even though it's really crummy and cheap. So like there's the photograph of the bed, but in order to commemorate the event that happened in the room, uh, the contours are very carefully drawn of the folds in the bed sheet which is a way of memorialising what happened. And so all the high points are red, and then the troughs in the bed sheet are purple. And it really shows the room at about 8.20 in the morning when the motel maid has just come in, and she has some pillows on her jolly, which is being pushed through the door. And I tried to suggest, by implication, what goes on. And um, there's some, I saw a lovely poem by Manon, I think, of, about nuance, how uh, we mustn't state everything very heavily and boldly, but it should be suggested in terms of the nuance. He says, what we want is nuance, not the reality. Um, all the rest is literature. So the next drawing after this was to take a map of part of South America. And this is near Lake Titicaca, shown down the bottom left hand part as a black area. And this is seeing a map in terms of a bed. And in the bottom left-hand part, we have the Andes Mountains, and then the plains to the right. And it's about the only map I could find which didn't have any roads on it. Even the map of the Himalayas had lots of towns and things like roads on it. So it made a much better bed sheet because of that. And I think what I found interesting about doing this is that you could see it in one way in terms of a bed sheet, and another way in terms of a map. And making links between the two became quite an interesting game. For example, the black in the bottom left-hand corner and in the top right-hand corner represent the edge of the bed. So seen in terms of a map, it becomes like the edges of the world. So you would see a flat world with tempests at the edge not a round world. And then the fact that in the left-hand part of the map there's a great sepia shadow which represents the shadow projected by the top sheet and the bottom sheet could, seen in terms of a map, be a vast great trench, you know, about 500,000 feet deep. And the same with the pillow, which is in the right-hand part of the drawing. That could be a huge mountain peak which would make Everest look like some little hill. And what's a pity about it is that in the original map, which is actually a US Air Force <coughs> navigational chart, there's some yellow areas which represent really high ground. And they could be bed stains, you see stains on the sheet. But in order to make the pillow seem higher, I had to go through yellow and orange. So it didn't really work as bed stains anymore. So there are all sorts of illusions one can make between the bed and that. And I think, say, the lakes around the middle of the picture could be holes in the sheet, so you're looking through to the mattress beneath. <coughs> now, this is a, the floor slab. Is that focused, that one? Mm. Not quite. <coughs> that's about it. Um, this is a house that's being built in Florence. And all you can see there is the concrete slab and the little hut that the guy is living in by the side. 
And so we go on. How did that come out? I haven't seen the slides of these yet. Mind if I stand back and just have a quick look? This started off as a project for a book that was being written by Sight Inc. in New York called Unbuilt America, which was going to be full of projects designed in America to be built in America that had never got built because for some reason or other they were too adventurous, too expensive, too beautiful, too whatever. And I didn't have anything like that. So I decided to do a drawing of a built-in, of an unbuilt house, which shows a building site and parts of the building which have been put up and other parts which have just been delivered by truck and are stored on the site. And so the intention was in this to make you not quite sure whether it's being put up or whether it's being taken down. I, cried, I tried to uh, suggest a lot of ambiguities in it. So like at the top, you had a wall that was collapsed with the blocks lying all over the place. So that would further lead to the confusion as to whether it was being built or being demolished. And the original idea behind it was that it would be built for a couple who kept changing their mind. First they would want it one way, and go to the architect and he would make plans and so on. And then maybe the husband would be looking through a magazine and he'd see something he liked in the magazine. And suddenly the old idea would be no longer good enough. So he'd want it changed. And what I tried to do was to have a different colour for each change of mind, so that the pencil might represent the last stage, the orange might represent the first stage, and then the yellow, the middle stage, but it hasn't worked out quite as I intended, really. So all these different stages that the design went through would be shown, you see. And the final stage, it was very grandiose because as time has gone on, their ideas have become bigger and bigger until at the end they envisage a huge podium which is going to have classical columns sitting on it. So you can see the Corinthian capital stored up in the left, the top left, which, by the way, are very accurately drawn. I discovered that Corinthian capitals are the most beautiful things. And it's funny, one of the reviews I was on yesterday was of the Vienna project. And one of them had a sort of strict classicism, where you had cornices and things, but they were cleaned up. You didn't have any dentals hanging down. And I thought that was a bit of a cop-out, really. I thought, you know, if you're going to do that, you should do it completely and properly. And have all the acanthus leaves and scrolls. Um, there's a storage mass of concrete blocks in the bottom left. And I always remember thinking how nice they looked because they could be seen as a model of an apartment building, you know, a bit like Marseille, where each hole in the block represents a balcony. And to do the truck chassis in the same drafting technique as the Corinthian columns, I thought would bring about some confusion as to whether the columns were made out of steel and rubber or whether the truck chassis was made out of marble. And I don't know how well that came out either. I think I have to do it a bit more and heavy up the pencil lines a bit for that. But you can see at the back the first idea, which was a simple wood frame. So it represents a transition from very simple architecture and straightforward to this incredibly complex classicism at the end. Now this one 
is a study in shadow projection. And I want to just draw a little more. Could I have the lights on again, please? <coughs> This grew out of the visit I made to the Museum of Modern Art at the Beaux-Arts show, which had the most incredible drawings in it. It was really You walked around and you saw these monstrous drawings about an eight-foot square, which must have taken about a year to do. And some of the shadows drawn on the classical columns and temples and things were so incredible that I wanted to really find out how they worked and how they were set up. So I spent a week looking through all the books to try and find out how shadows were projected on buildings. And I thought it might be rather nice to do the following. You see, you had the sort of classic exercise in shadow projection. And if you have, for example, uh, on plan, a square cap sitting over a cylindrical drum like that, that looks in elevation like that, then the light comes down at 45 degrees. Then you have that happening. So that being the area of shadow. And what you do, as you probably know, is draw a lot of construction lines at 45 degrees and project them up and so on. So you end up with that shaped shadow. Being the shadow projected on a circular drum of a square capital. Well, what I thought it might be rather nice to do would be to say, see that not as a cylindrical drum, but as a square column which on the fan might be like that, you see. But maintaining that same shape shadow, what shape would the cap have to be in order to cast that shadow, you see? And I won't do that. It's a pity I forgot to hand that drawing, but there was another drawing which showed that. And in fact, the plan is something like that of the cap above the cylinder. <laughs> And there was another one which was even crazier because I think what I did was to have a circular cat sitting over a cylinder like that. And there it is. And you get a much more elegant shadow that way like that. And the plan of that was an absurd piece of material that came up like that. So, and the point behind this would be that you have a columned building which, seen from the front, looks completely conventional. But in fact, you move one inch to the right, or the sun moves one degree, and you've got a completely crazy assemblage of concrete planes and things, you see. So, let's, can you turn that light again? So let's go back to this other drawing. I hope if there are any uh, middle school people here, they won't mind, but I'd better describe this again. Uh, this friend of mine, Giuliano, did a drawing called Reading Mrs. Dalloway, which was the structure designed for reading a book in. And it consisted of two walls of concrete about 200 feet long, six inches wide and about four feet apart. And placed in between these two concrete walls was a cage structure with a bed on it, which would be vertical uh, at the beginning of the day. And as the sun came up and over and down again, this bed would gradually travel through the concrete walls until at the end of the day, it was right at the other end of the walls. And you lay on the bed, starting to read the book by Virginia Woolf, Mrs. Dalloway. And gradually, always being perpendicular to the sun, you would travel through this structure 
And at the end of the day, you would have finished the book there on the last page when the sun finally went down. And the point was that it would be a structure that would be used once, only once, because you would only read that one book within the structure. And somehow that was the beauty of it, of making this incredibly complex structure that would be used one day in someone's life, and by only that person. <coughs> And likewise, this was a house that would only work for one split second of the day when the sun happened to be at just the right angle. Is it possible that no one's up there? Well, we can probably do it. But essentially, the drawing is um, this strip here is the plan sequence. And then immediately by the side of it, drawn in pencil, is the elevation the side view of that same plan. And the drawing is really based on the illusions of draftsmanship, the illusions of orthographic projection, that if you are putting tones on a drawing, they tend to get darker as they go towards the horizon. And if you accept those illusions, then the drawing actually works. Uh, do you think perhaps you could have it completely done on this front of wall? Would that work? No, it shows up too much of the others, doesn't it? That's fine, that would be better. <coughs> or maybe we should all have it on the ceiling. <coughs> no? <laughs> He's going to put something in front of it. Is part of it shaved off on the left? There should be a bit more down on the left of the screen. Not. I not There was a gradation. Now, the observer stands down at the bottom of the slide, and there is missing from this slide the receding tones marked in shades of grey. So you've got very light grey near the observer, and almost black right at the top of the picture. And the planes that go to make up the building, the roof and the walls, are all completely separate from each other. And the shadow that falls across the building is cast by a plane which is suspended right up in the air. I don't know if you can see that. The top drawing that's done with Pantone is a complete house. All the planes shown in juxtaposition <coughs> to each other, so that it reads like a real house. But when the sun moves about one degree, then that completely disappears, because the plane that casts the shadow that simulates the effect of a projecting roof on the wall, when the sun moves, that shadow changes and swings round. So it's all bunched up in the lower picture down on the left-hand side of the house. And the more the sun goes round, the more that illusion is lost. Now the wall itself of the house, as shown in the top Pantone drawing, is divided into two parts. And when the sun is at that angle, it actually works. They read together as one plane, but as soon as the sun changes, gets higher in the sky, then these two planes become very distinct from each other. And like on the roof, the chimney is really leaning forwards towards you. But it's just that in the top drawing, when the sun is at that angle, it seems to be vertical. So when the sun climbs higher in the sky, then the chimney, because it's now in shade, seems as dark as the background, so it tends to disappear. Now these are of two collapsed floor slabs. In the bottom picture, you have 
a flow of slab which is related to a grid. And in the top one, the grid is shown contracting with consequently disastrous results on the floor panels. Because each corner of the floor panel relates to the point of the intersection of the grid lines, then what happens? They can't uh, leave that position. They can't float away from their grid line. So you get this terrible collision right in the middle. And I assume that there was some sort of damp-proof membrane under the floor panels, which is a red color. So this would start to ooze out when the collision happens. And I wanted it to happen both in terms of the floor panels themselves, this collision, and in terms of the drafting technique. And so the pantone that's been stuck on, I've actually got it curling up off the drawing because the pantone itself has taken a bashing when the panels crash together. And I forgot to mention the other big influence, but I think one of the most fantastic draftsmen I've seen is the Viennese guy, Walter Pichler. And when you look at Abraham's work and St. Florian and all those people, you realize that they owe a hell of a lot to Pichler. And it'd be great if you know, an exhibition of his could come here. And his drawings somehow vary between an incredible perfection of line. I mean, no one can control a pencil like he can. The most incredible drawings. And they vary between that and the sort of amazing violence that he commits towards the paper he uses. Like when he starts off a drawing, it seems that he gets a piece of handmade paper and screws it up into a ball and then stretches it out on the drawing board and starts drawing. But there's incredible violence. And when I first did a version of this, someone said to me that it wasn't violent enough, this coming together. And so I really tried to make it as violent as possible. The actual collisions point. <coughs> so this one is the same basic project. And it reverts, in a way, to the bed drawing, that uh, you have contours which show the various heights of the panels as they collide together. And just like a physical map in an atlas, where you start off with dark green around the rivers and the seas and work up through yellow and orange <coughs> to purple and white at the top of the mountains. This one is slightly different in the sense that the grids have actually separated out when they compress together. So you have a hole in the middle, which I thought was rather like a black hole in space. So that becomes a pink black hole. Now this one is called uh, an answer to the question that Corbusier posed. Because it seems that when he designed the Domino House, he was saying, you know, for the first time we're really liberated from having to work with heavy concrete walls and tiny window openings. So we can have, you know, incredible free spaces and partitions flowing in and out and so on. So this very consciously misunderstands what he had in mind. And you can see critical standard metal windows being stacked up ready to use in that. And it's really funny what happened when I did this, because I thought, once having had the initial idea, I thought I could just go ahead and do the drawing anyhow and put the concrete blocks wherever I felt like it and put window openings in in the very worst possible way, you know, a sort of terrible symmetry. And when I'd done it like that, it really looked so terrible, I couldn't bear it. <laughs> so I tried to pretty it up. And I thought it looked better like this than like I had it before. It re looked really ugly before. And I thought it might lead a new dimension to it, just to have the door frames and window frames stacked outside rather than have them actually in the space, set in place. 
So, I mean, if you're born an old ice thief, you really can't get away from it. You've always got it from that. painting of the luminous mushroom because I love putting on paint and making divine blues and I had it framed up and so on and then covered in a sheet of perspex and you know they fit it in place for you and they as a last final gesture they remove the protective paper I thought, you know, as I was ripping off this protective paper, that it looked so nice, just the tantalizing little glimpse one had of the painting, that it was a shame to rip it off completely. <coughs> of course, you know, it was too late then, because I'd done it, so I stuck another piece back on. And you know, all that information and the instructions give a different dimension to the painting. And the nice thing about the original version is, you know, when you're taking off the original protected paper, is that there's this lovely science fiction-like goo that sticks the paper to the plexiglass, the perspex. And that was completely lost when I stuck on a fresh sheet. So to simulate that, I got some latex and poured it around the joint, you see, and photographed it, but then the dry latex looked terrible because latex is lovely when it's all wet and squidgy, but when it dries it turns a rather foul brown colour. So it had to be photographed while the latex was still wet. Um, so that was a voluminous mushroom, which doesn't really exist like that. There are luminous mushrooms. They're called jack-o'-lantern toadstools and they grow in North America, although I've never seen one. But this one is really based on an orchid called the Brasso Catigian, which is a very beautiful orchid. There's another one. So I thought there might be an unveiling at the opening, you know, when the paper is finally ripped off. This was uh, the subject of the birth of Venus. Um, very architectural, really. Um, the idea behind it was that uh, you would represent the myth of the birth of Venus in very the foam changing into these globules, you had the dots changing shape, expanding and contracting, so that electronically you had the figure of Venus, like it shows in the right hand drawing. And I got the out of the surface, and at the top it shows how these dots change. So, if you finish with the eight by ten with other transparencies laid over them showing showing changing let's just see how that one can out <coughs> and then there are ghost images of all the cherubs and the goddess herself which suggest uh, bad reception on the TV But what I wanted to do in this was to try and paint it so that the figure of Venus looks exactly like the foam upon which he's lying. You see, so there's the confusion between what is skin and what is foam. But the change actually goes a bit too far because I want to show some sort of cancerous lesion opening up. You can see that the cherubs are slightly deformed and misshapen. This, this is the beginning of the earlier one, which shows the start of the globules. 
foam breaking with a thunder cloud in the background. So I love doing this best of all, really. So those are the uh, have questions. that man who used to make very unpolite comments, but who I'm told has quietened down a lot. Oh yes, you over there. No. <laughs> Occupation with con or these structures? <coughs> this this for these structures. Yeah. This, <coughs> this structure. Yeah, I think that rather worries me actually. I don't know. Although perhaps it shouldn't. But uh, somehow the basic notion that it's in some way unhealthy to like things <coughs> collapsing and destroying themselves. But, I mean, there was a period in the 18th century, isn't it, when everyone was painting ruins and building ruins, in fact. And I think recently there's been a lot of it, because this same group I mentioned, site, you know, they've done the um, shopping centre in Richmond in Virginia, which shows the peeling facade. And that represents somehow a building which wasn't quite properly built. Or the... Shop, uh, uh, the same shopping centre in Houston, which shows uh, a brick facade that looks like it's been bombed from the centre. Yeah? Looks like a great wreckers ball has come. Brickwork if it's floating outwards. You know, and so I think it's a sort of preoccupation that a lot of people have right now. But how do you account for it? I don't know. I just wonder whether they have any kind of uh, relationship to your original drawing, um, the Bowery's period, which was supposed to be, you know, mm -hmm. have uh, something slightly horrific. Um, you know, you know. No, I think this preoccupation seems to perhaps imply an interest in the past rather than the future, for one thing. I think we're all very fascinated by what might be happening in 10 or 20 years, say back in the 60s. You know, and all the drawings done at that time seem to predict a state of affairs that might be happening around about 75 or 85. I was just thinking going along in a bus on Oxford Street the other day how none of those predictions <coughs> seem to have come true. All that actually come true more about three years ago. I think it certainly does represent some sort of fascination with the past rather than the present or the future. And especially when you look at the columns up there, the Corinthian capitals, that's definitely a hard back, isn't it? Do you do these projects with students? Well, some of them, yeah. Like the first one over there was a student project. No, this was uh, the say the collapsing floor plates or the birth of the Venus. Is an activity for you, or are you, are you an activity for something else? No, not really. No, what I do when I go into my little room and work <laughs> from the teaching. You don't. You don't. I don't think they'd sign up if I did. I think there's a big rift 
between what a lot of us around my age are interested in and what the students are interested in doing. Well, uh, which I, I think is the same at the AA. I was thinking you wouldn't, there are parts of the AA where you would, you would find very receptive students for that kind of talk. Really? Mm. Oh, that's nice to know. <laughs> hmm, a small part or? I mean, I got the impression that the majority of the students wouldn't really have appreciated working on this sort of project at all. <coughs> Most of them were interested in doing buildings. I'm not going to use that word conceptual, although I just did. Well, I suppose that seems very similar. similar to that. Could you say something then about um, the generation? About, I mean, do you talk out the ideas with other people around you? you know? Not as much as I should, no, I don't know. No. I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with the sort of person I am. I mean, I get very fascinated by ideas but somehow don't seem to have the stamina to carry them through. You know, I could work on one particular idea, say, for six months, and then go on to something else, just like the client, the imagined client in that point at the end there, constantly, in a very is excited by something else, something different. So you make a project of a particular drawing, or idea, and then you go on a sort of being uh, serves you beautifully for a few years, but then you find yourself the next idea to go on to. I find it very difficult. Um, I can remember the way back in the old days. Yeah. One you had. I shall not use the word conceptual either. Whether uh, <laughs> you had a photographic mind, but I can remember watching you work mm -hmm. and starting on a white sheet of paper <laughs> at the bottom left hand corner and doing a whole drawing, sort of working up, spider like if you like, <laughs> until it was completed and being absolutely baffled and absolutely amazed by this process. I don't know if you ever remember that drawing. I think it was really? one of the since entered drawings. Really? Yeah. What amazed you about that though? How do you know I didn't well, have any notes spinning around? That's that 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 didn't amaze me with I didn't do it. But I've never seen anybody who drawing that way before. Yeah. Well, I think that's the beauty. So you had yeah? the whole thing uh, sort of photographed on that piece of paper, and you were just beginning to see something. <laughs> you know, and suddenly it emerged. A bit like a child does a jigsaw puzzle. You know, and he finds a corner. Yeah. You know, and you know that then it's suddenly going to, 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 to emerge across the sheet. Yeah. I think that's the nice thing about Are you aware of that or work your way? Well, I don't think I do work that way, really. I mean, you don't? No, no, no. I usually you start a drawing and then you get cheesed off with it. Start it again. Mm. I remember watching. Really? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you destroyed a legend of a, a, a myth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I was going to mention Pichler's drawings because when you look at them, I think the opposite to Pichler is one of Ron's, a very beautiful drawing of Ron's I saw yesterday, which was a house for the king and queen. No, that's not right, is it? It's Elizabeth and her consort. Is he still called a consort? I suppose he is. It was incredibly beautiful and perfect and finished. You know, it really looked finished, and it's not just that he has that film stuck down to it. So you can't add anything to it, if, even if you want to. <laughs> but Pichler is just the opposite, because 
you know, after, as I said before, Pichler has finished screwing up his piece of paper, so it's got about 2,000 wrinkles in it, and he starts drawing. You feel that he hasn't got a clue of what he's going to draw when he starts, and tentatively he makes a few lines, and gradually ideas come to him. And you feel that although he's put it in the exhibition, the one at the bottom, which implies a certain sort of completion, you know, at least he says, well, there's enough there so I can put it in the exhibition. Um, you feel that he could go on for years adding to it and working on it and changing his mind, because when you look into the drawing, you can see hundreds of ghost lines of former ideas, and it's beautiful in a very different way from Ron's the beauty Ron puts into his drawings. Um, but there's a constant sort of thinking as he draws. I think with Ron's and Peter's and all, you know, everyone's, uh, it was all planned out beforehand, very carefully. No? Not that drawing. Not that drawing. I had a Yeah. <laughs> really? But that's because you've done that drawing before. <laughs> but it's a nice, I think, opposite way of working on the drawing, you see. <coughs> uh, Pichler, it, it's almost self-conscious with him, you know, if one is to make some tiny criticism, that he almost overdoes it. He's very careful to leave early pencil lines in. He'd never rubbed them out, like we were, probably. Mm. Nervously giggle at each other. Was one of the things that might have happened that, that architects might be involved in building things on the moon by now, like ten, ten maybe five years ago? Well, I think <coughs> there were already at that time quite considerable plans for that. I think we wanted to build moon structures on the Earth. Really, you know, it's funny. I mean, I'm in Rhode Island doing a study at the moment with some students of a space habitat which is meant to orbit around the Earth. And there was this funny man at Princeton who got some grant money from the government to do a project like this in which he had a rotating cylinder and he recreated part of the Earth inside the cylinder. But that's got rather nice possibilities, you know, of low gravity or non-gravity, the sort of architecture that might be suggested by that. What was the question again? I forgot. I asked, um, <laughs> 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 and the only other thing I can see is to make architecture richer with, with all the subtleties of, of nature and <coughs> the things coming into our sunlight where and, and to go on kind of enriching it and getting things which will last a long time when they're good. Well, like how? I mean, in what way enriching it? Uh, well, just in, in a... Uh, oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, well, I don't know. Exactly, but maybe maybe yeah. in, in an art way, I don't know. In, well, I mean, like uh, light traveling across a room can be poetic in relation to the, to the room, rather than just a bland opening. It is it's already beautifully poetic in hundreds yeah. of buildings I can think of. Mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> now, I was sort of interested in really making fun of architecture in this. Do you feel the architecture has to be there in the first place? Like the fun is understood by a few architects. And it's made, it's like bounce back. <coughs> oh yeah, it's terribly esoteric, if I've got the right meaning of that word. Inward looking, mm -hmm. pertaining to a small group. Yeah, but the architecture is already there, isn't it? Done by thousands of other people. <coughs> I, someone asked the other day whether a guy from the GLC housing unit came along here, whether it would mean anything to him. 
I mean, I don't mind if it does because I do something because I really want to do it a lot. And if it does change his mind and make him think, then that's great. But if it doesn't, you know, it can't be helped. It ought to. say what other people's influence has been on me, but I'd rather leave that to them. Talk about any influence I might have in work on them. But if you teach, don't you decide how you want to influence you or give them some guideline to your Well, yeah, I should try and see what's in them, shouldn't I? I mean, and expose them to a lot of different people's work more than just my own. I'm not interested in influencing other people, really. It's a very private world. I mean, again, I can talk about how Pickler has influenced me because his work is incredibly private and inward-looking, which is why I mentioned the devout Catholic bit before, because in the museum introduction it talks about his Catholicism and how it's an almost priest-like attitude to his work that he has. You know, he lives on this farm outside Vienna and is a very shy, inward-looking person and hates teaching, which I think is interesting, and just likes to draw, and he doesn't say much about his work. And it's very private. You know, when he draws, for example, a chair for a suicide in a mountain, you feel less for him one day. Or when he draws a barn, it's going to be a barn that's built on his farm. It's all very private and inward looking. And I don't think he worries about it, and I certainly don't worry about how I influence people. Do you think I should? Do you think yeah. I, you should? Anyone should? I would just think it's an interesting way of looking into the future of people's work. Because I'm interested in the future of people's work. Things you want people to respect to, or to perhaps something that is to you, but they discover it and it's perhaps a bad response. Mm, I and mean, it could be easier, either. perhaps influence people, and, and it created bad architecture. Hmm. Do you think if it presented its work in a different way, it would have had that effect? Maybe. I mean, was he very capable of being misunderstood, perhaps? Peter Blake, he wrote a nice article in the Atlantic Monthly in which he took, I think, the basic ten dictum, dicta, you know, we get of, you know, how it's been done, how those dicta have been misunderstood over the years. So, you know, that Well, I don't think I would have stayed here, I think. 
uh, I find it very pressurising to be in London somehow. All these people around me working away. I find it rather frightening. I liked it better in America because it's a bit more relaxed over there, contrary to what most people think. And I find it rather threatening in London somehow. Um, I mean, I have a small circle of friends who are working, producing drawings and designs for buildings and so on, but they're all slightly different, so I can still feel myself an individual. But, uh, and I like being about 3,000 miles away, you know, just writing to people and seeing what they've done. But I find it very close over here. <laughs> well, I'll ask a question to lead on to the next question, which would be what? What do you feel upon I mean, what you, the ideas? You were saying that um, this guy outside the end that he had his very personal um, daily trivial things to deal with, which for him was really sacred, mm. and he used that as a source. Mm. Um, somebody else hinted that perhaps also that teacher actually fed on their students. Um, yeah. In a way, that was what. What, what, what the question to you was about uh, and somebody else. <coughs> but you are saying that you see it as a very personal thing to yourself and you don't get the inspiration to do things. Yeah, so I mean, wherever you are, you know, you can see what's going on. And I meet these guys and I'm all there. And I think New York's a terrific, terrific place to be because there's so much happening there. It's very energizing. And, uh, Yeah, that, I think that's enough. Mike, do you consciously look for, uh, I hate to use the word, inspiration, or does it just sort of appear, uh, you're just sitting in a chair or whatever in a restaurant and you see something that attracts your attention? and it gives you ideas for some uh, No, usually you project. I usually usually copy project. copy other people, actually. Other <laughs> people? And pervert it to my own. Well, you don't take it from natural sources? No, and doesn't everyone do that? I mean, you go around to your friend's apartment and there's a sheet of drawing lying on the drawing board, covered up with a bit of canvas or something, and he's out of the room, you know, lift up and see what he's up to. Uh, no, I'm serious. I think that's how ideas get spread. They get adapted by one person to another. No, no, no. I don't. I don't, but, I mean, Peter's very kind to mention spontaneous gestation. But, uh, gestation, I'm sorry. But, um, I'd like to think it was like that, but... We had to copy ideas from laundrettes and things like that. Mm. Yeah, that's good. That's marvelous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very rarely, very rarely from other two. Well, okay, with the exception of perhaps Paul and one or two others. Alto and I suppose me. But certainly not with anybody else very much. I don't. You know, like Sterling's. And so on, but yeah. I don't think I would sort of look at one left hand corner of his work at all. Mm. But I might look at a, I don't know, a, a laundrette, a washing machine, something like that. Yeah. I'm just looking. I just wondered whether you did take from, you know, objects. I think, say, the collapsing floor slabs is terribly sight like <laughs> well, that's the 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 Yes, that's right, yeah. Sculpture in the environment, it stands for. They do the melting brick facades and all. Um, there's been plenty of other things. I remember years ago when you were doing the, the Simpson and Jeremy two books I ever saw you looked at were the Valksman book at mm. that point in building. Mm. And then some Bucky. And I always 
I'm very conscious of that time that you gets lost. Yeah. But everyone does that, I think. Yeah. Except yeah. one. No, no. no. <laughs> I think they do. I mean, without knowing it. Not without knowing it. People always sort of photography and uh, Xerox and things like that. Yes. Yeah. Trying to get rid of the original image. Yes. Yes. Because um, I don't go around. Perhaps. <laughs> Trace an idea, and we're like a pedigree of a dog somewhere. Um, like that one at the end, the shadow projection job. <coughs> you know, if you look at the cover of Art in America uh, months ago, there's some guy, and I think it was an accident, you see, what he did, but there was a mound uh, surrounded by a concrete frame set at receding intervals. And I don't think he intended it to be an illusion created by strange shadow projections. But when I first picked a lot of people were talking to me, and I had to answer them, so I didn't get a chance to really look at it properly. It was about that. I thought, what a great idea. And then when I got into it more, I saw that that wasn't the idea at all. So I thought, I'm going out of that. down so that it only works for one second out of the day has really a lot to do with the drawing reading Dalloway of the birdpots of the plains of concrete and illuminated by the sun and that in itself is like as to be embarrassing so there's this genealogy of ideas which one person picks up and tosses down again, and someone else picks them up. And that's how with the history of music, it's just... They each other like... You know, half Handel's music was written by someone else, and that's a fact. I don't know. Huh? Certainly in this is laughing and you call it tutoring. <laughs> you can see a, 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 a student scheme and suddenly you realise that you are translating it into your own yeah. uh, mind. Yeah. And the student can get terribly annoyed because that was not what he intended whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> But you give a new flavour and meaning to it, didn't you? Yeah, take it. That's great. In fact, it may be more. Yeah. <laughs> In his terms. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sort of doing a bit of typical English self effacement by talking about cribbing, but. Um, no, no, I've never direct. Translation. The translation, yes. <laughs> I mean, like. There was a project in the uh, Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in New York, which was a complete copy of Abraham's Curtain House, which I'm sure you saw when you were here. Complete crib. It was embarrassing, you know, and how a guy could do that, which would be so obvious to anyone who knew the original. Just amazing how they could do it, except his columns at the corners were a bit thicker. But still the same curtains fluttering out in space. That's self-defeating, isn't it? Nothing new under the sun. To go on the phone. Yeah. But we're embarrassed about making architecture, and perhaps that's it, and not the inability to design old 
enough to want to make elaborate drawings on it. And, uh, I don't know. Maybe. But you wouldn't want to have been an artist. Is that alpha, is it architecture? It doesn't matter. Really. It's what you want to do that's important. If that's you're lucky enough, they would have free time I, to do I, it. I think the jump off point may be quite important that you are getting away from something towards something else that comes out. And therefore, the original scaffold is down. You know, Quite often, there are very good uh, artists. I mean, there are very there are, there are artists who are in fact much better architects than we are, and vice versa. And vice versa, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, maybe it hinges around how people are going to use what you do. Would you just explain? seems to me as, as a sort of picture that it's like um, a horse race yes. without a course and without a finish line. Like a horse race? Yeah, without without a course and without a finish line. I mean, that's what that's is it? Right. Well, the, the way you talk about it, that is sort of, you look at what other people do and you try to sort of uh, digest it half from them work a bit on it and toss it out to somebody else and then it somehow seems, I mean, where is it leading to? Yes, I often ask that, yeah. And it just seems so... What's the important thing? thing it's raising something. <laughs> that makes me happier and I can't think of anything else I could do that would make me happier than doing what I'm doing. And I'm lucky enough to have enough free time to do it. And that's a big point. I don't have to work in an office. Uh, and so I don't mind about where it's leading to. Uh, um. It's an easy, or not, it's not easy, either. it's a nice way of getting rid of preconceived ideas out of so I forget the name of the sculptor, because the sculptor who just thumbs up some steel manufacturer and tells him the sizes of whatever it is, these plates that are welded, and tells him where to put them and how to weld them. He puts the phone down. He never even goes to see the thing. Mm. He's a famous sculptor. And it's probably a very important part of it that he never yeah. actually sees his exactly. work. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like something that would go in that book called Conceptual Heart by Lucy Lippard, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yes. But yeah, that's a bit tough. Ah, he's spoken. Nobody <laughs> knows. <laughs> I said he had heavy phone books. Heavy phone books? <laughs> <laughs> I don't quite get the heavy phone books. <laughs> oh, thank you. It takes someone to explain the, the subtlety of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to continue, since you have pointed yes. in at me, I don't suppose I'm the only person who's been publicly sorted by but I suppose I'm the only one who's been publicly sorted by uh, having come to about three or four hundred people. Remember 1966? Yes, I remember that. Yeah, I remember your comments. That's all I'm going to say. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so really you haven't changed your feelings at all? Did you hit him? Publicly assaulted. That's okay. Really, really much 
<laughs> yes. But, you know, the other people here don't know about your assault, so would you like to explain? <laughs> yes, but I'm biased, you see. Ah. Mm. <laughs> oh, we can't bring him out. <coughs> no, I, I, I forget. I remember the nature of your assault, but I don't remember the... <laughs> so I'm really being masochistic. Um, I don't remember exactly what your points were. It was a long time ago.